This is episode number 11, The History and Future of Cannabis and Psychedelics in Medicine with Lorenzo Haggerty from the Psychedelic Salon. Today, you're going to be hearing a lot about the history and also therapeutic benefits of medical marijuana and psychedelics. All of this on the Health and Wellness and Sanitas podcast. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Lisa Thorpe with Health and Wellness and Sanitas. And today we have Lorenzo Haggerty with Psychedelic Salon joining us. And I'm very excited to have you with us, Lorenzo. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, it's my pleasure. And you're not our typical guest. You're not a <laughs> practitioner. But I'm I'm very, very excited to, to listen to everything that you're doing in addition to uh, the the, your podcast. You have an incredible history of amazing events and being kind of in the right place at the right time, I guess. So why don't, I'll let you go ahead and, and talk about your podcast and who well, you the, are. The podcast, of, of course, is called The Psychedelic Salon, and, and uh, it started out, uh, well, back in 2005 as a hobby. Uh, not even that. I wanted to try the technology. I'm kind of geeky, you know, and uh, so I'd produce some lectures at Burning Man and uh, I had them up on the web already in little 10-minute segments because there's not an easy way to do it before the uh, podcast uh, feed came along. And uh, so I, I put those together and I started putting those out and and uh, wasn't really paying any attention. But uh, long story short, uh, some kids got a hold of me from uh, London and another one out in uh, Missouri or someplace that was doing podcasts. And it turns out I'd, I'd had a lot of people downloading the podcast. And uh, so it's... Uh, Basically, the the main the main theme of it would be called philosophy, and uh, yet my audience uh, is it's a large audience. Fifteen to thirty five is the general age range, and uh, you know there's uh, you know we've had well over a million different people download uh, podcasts, and there's uh, depends who the speaker is, but there's a half a million or so every month that just came out of nowhere. I don't do advertising. I don't even have Google ads on my website because. Uh, uh, a lot of the young people don't want to uh, be associated with the word because it's uh, sort of a negative word, although it's changing. But as a result of uh, playing these lectures, and I started playing lectures by uh, Terrence McKenna after the ones that I uh, recorded myself at Burning Man, and, and then the Timothy Leary estate gave me the archive of all the Timothy Leary uh, uh, talks, and then uh, Ralph Abraham gave me uh, a whole big box of tapes that he and Terrence McKenna and Rupert Sheldrake had done at Esalen. This is cultural gold. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just, I like listening to these things. And so I do a little commentary, I introduce it, I play the talk, and I, uh, you know, play, have some commentary afterwards most of the time. And then uh, this year, uh, a few months ago, uh, maybe about four months ago, uh, three uh, women were had a, a conversation about psychedelics. And one is a woman who's a, a practicing woman uh, shaman. She's in her 50s and has a couple children. The other one just got her PhD and just had a new baby. And the third one is uh, in her early 20s, just out of college. And uh, all three of them are very active in doing uh, uh, university-level research in psychedelics. Uh, you know, the one got her uh, Master's of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School. And anyhow, they had a conversation. In it, they're saying how... Well, you know, and the women in the psychedelic community don't get to talk on the stage very often. And so, you know, it's always, it's still, it's an old white guy up on the stage is what it's been. <laughs> and so I turned over half of the podcast to them. And they haven't quite been able to get enough together every other time yet. But so now we're enlarging the audience. And uh, some of the young men are a little unhappy about not getting all Terrence McKenna all the time. But uh, it's really been an eye opener even for me to uh, listen to these women speak. And then they're bringing in uh, some talks from the, uh, Women's Visionary Congress, which uh, is is really a big movement taking on now, and you know we talk about issues, uh, and uh, they talk about issues, and I promote them, uh, not just about uh, doing drugs and psychedelics and the philosophy, but uh, the difficulties that particularly women have in the psychedelic community because they can't kind of stand up and be counted because their children would be taken away a lot of times. Right. So it's a real kind of a dicey thing, but over the last ten years, things have changed so much. 
in the way of uh, psychedelic research, uh, serious university level, uh, medical school level research into uh, various psychedelic medicines. All that stopped in the 70s and it's a big resurgence now, uh, particularly outside of the US, there's a lot more going on. So uh, from the medical point of view, uh, the biggest news right now, of course, is, is cannabis, medical marijuana. And there's just the news about that is so astounding, and people, people used to, uh, you know, I lived in Florida up until about 15 years ago, and it was talking about the left coast, and yeah, medical marijuana, just right. so, yeah. Well, I was one of those people that made those jokes, <laughs> <laughs> but things have changed, and and my eyes have really been opened. Uh, uh, just last uh, year, maybe it was this year, uh, my wife and, and a friend of hers from nursing school, that they've been together for a long time, uh, both nurses, uh, went to a, uh, it was a conference about medical marijuana, and I think there was uh, supposed to be 250 people there, and they sold over 500 seats, all medical professionals from around the world, and the research that's going on and being done is just amazing. Uh, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll stop there and let you ask some questions before oh, well, I start heading in that direction. I No, you're, you're bringing it all home. It's perfect, Lorenzo. And, and the fact is that these are medicines. And, and there are there's been reports now about the research being done even for psychedelics being used for things like post-traumatic stress or cancer. So... I'm glad that you were that you brought that to the light, and I'm I'm curious how how did you wind up in burning at Burning Man? How did this all get started, <laughs> and and how at what point did you realize that this was going to? I was shamed into going to Burning Man the first time. <laughs> uh, a woman, the first time I went to a Terrence McKenna lecture was up at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and then. Uh, she and I and a couple other people that were at that workshop went to uh, signed up to go to a workshop in Palenque, Mexico, uh, and that's where Mary C and I met, in fact. And so we uh, we met down there, and she says, "You know, for my 60th birthday, I'm going to Burning Man." Well, she and I turned 60 the what, same year. Uh, what year was this? It I'm was curious. in two. Uh, I was actually in 2002. 2002. 2002. And uh, so, you know, she kept saying she was going to do it. And, so, and, of course, we had so many friends here in California that go. So long story short, we went. And Burning Man is, uh, you know, it's a gift community. And so uh, we decided right away we want to go back the next year. And to come up with a gift to give to the community, Mary C. and I came up with the idea of taking the Palenque Lecture Series, where we'd met in Palenque, Mexico, which was a psychedelic medicine lecture series, and move it to up north. So we called it Palenque Norte. And we had, uh, we had like eight or nine speakers that first year, and people laughed at us. They said, you know, this is Burning Man, and, and people are up all night. They're not going to get up for a lecture during the daytime. But we had people like Alex Gray and Eric Davis and Daniel Pinchbeck and some of the name brand people in the community. And it was a huge success. And so, uh, long story short, uh, it's now one of, uh, I think, maybe uh, eight or ten lecture series at Burning Man. There's a whole section in the program, several pages, for psychedelic lecture series now. All spring we from started that. started it. And so, uh, yeah, I, Mary C. and I stopped going in 2007 was our last year. It's, 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 it's expensive. You know, it's hot. It's it's a lot of work, but uh, so we've turned the whole thing over to uh, a younger generation, and they they've just done amazing things with it. In fact, uh, I think that's forty speakers last year, including uh, the people from Johns Hopkins and Harvard that are doing research, along with uh, uh, a lot of big name professionals. And then they brought in one of the most uh, uh, out of the way uh, speakers for our series that you could think. The last speaker of the series was Grover Norquist the uh, tax pledge guy of the last 25 years. And uh, he did a, a, a really interesting talk and uh, it was a big question and answer se session and all. So it's a, a, a very psychedelic, which means mind manifesting uh, conference. So I'm curious, you were one of these conservative, you were an attorney, you were selling computers before anybody knew what a computer was. How, how does this conservative, uh, <laughs> very right... Uh, wing, or I don't know if you're right wing, but uh, a, <laughs> I was. an attorney. Yeah, how, how does how does that person become Lorenzo, who is now uh, bringing to light psychedelic research? Well, well, the the short version, I say, I used to be an Irish Catholic Republican lawyer, 
And uh, I was that when I walked into the Stark Club in Dallas, and when I walked out, I was still Irish. But uh, <laughs> what, what basically happened is uh, uh, MDMA, ecstasy. Uh, I was uh, in Dallas. I had a computer company. I'd, I'd, I'd left my practice of law in Houston, moved to Dallas, and uh, had a computer company that uh, we, we you know, had articles on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and had a four-color picture of me in Forbes magazine. And so we were in the high flying, you know, when it was early on before it got, you know, big business. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I'm in my 40s going through a midlife crisis. IBM comes in and starts crushing the company and we're having all kinds of financial issues. And about that time, a lawyer friend of mine called me uh, from Mississippi and said, hey, I hear Dallas is ground zero for ecstasy. What do you know about it? And I'd never even heard about it. That's the ecstasy is what they were calling MDMA at the time. And uh, long story short, I found out about it through a, a friend of my my uh, my ex wife, and uh, we <laughs> uh, I I uh, started using MDMA. And and that first night, I essentially uh, was taken back to the little boy I was when I was growing up in a lower middle class neighborhood, and I didn't want to. All of a sudden, I realized I was on the wrong path, doing the wrong things, and it just was a real eye awakening thing for me. Now, this is without any therapy or help or anything. People back then were just kind of feeling their way. And by pure happenstance, uh, Dallas, Texas, is where ecstasy hit the street as a recreational substance. It had been used here in the West Coast by therapists for years. There had been several thousand therapists trained to use it, and they'd been using it quite well here. And... uh, well, it wound up being uh, ground zero in Dallas, and then the Stark Club was in Dallas. The Stark Club is the uh, genesis of the the rave movement. The Stark music became house music in Chicago, and the Stark Club had bowls of MDMA on the on the bar, and and it it was legal. See, that wow. was the whole kicker. I never would have touched it. I'm a Vietnam vet. I'm a lieutenant commander in the Navy, and I'm a lawyer in Texas. I'd never smoked pot. You know, <laughs> had it been illegal, I would have got would not have gotten near it. But yeah. uh, it was legal then. Uh, since then, I've, I've seen uh, people use it themselves, my friends in the veterans community, to self-medicate for PTSD. But the really good news is that in South Carolina, Michael and Annie Mithoffer, uh, doctor and, and uh, nurse husband wife, have, uh, are, they're in the second phase of an MDMA research for post-traumatic stress disorder. And the first uh, phase, they had, uh, I think, all of the uh, the participants were rape victims. I don't think they have military in then. But the the phase one of a study is just to make sure that this substance isn't going to kill somebody. And so uh, they had, a, I, I don't know how many, maybe a dozen or so participants. But uh, one, one woman, it's been a couple of years since I read their initial findings, but the one woman I know uh, hadn't left the house in 16 years and now is holding down a job. And, and this and is after one. Th- what they they've worked they they're working on their protocol now in this phase two phase two study is where you try to really see different ways of administering it and all like that. But what they have found is and they're working with dosage and body weights and things like that because it is a medicine. And but what they have found is that uh, they administer it and have a, a trained therapist there during the whole time, and they take it. No more than three times, and generally I think just two. And this is why you won't see it uh, widespread talked about in the mainstream media because a pharmaceutical company doesn't want a drug that you only take twice in your life. And (laughs) you're you're better. They're doing it with therapy, but they've had amazing results. And now the Pentagon has approved this phase two study for them, so for veterans. And uh, there is a major study being planned for Southern California, which has the highest concentration of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, patients, uh, veterans primarily. And uh, it's going to be with MDMA out here, and it's going to be a very large-scale study, and they're trying to, they're raising the funding for it now and working on the protocols. And so those are some really significant uh, breakthroughs. And and uh, I have no doubt but what a, a significant number of, of veterans are going to be uh, seriously helped here in the next, uh, throughout the decade. It's going to take a while to get this done but because, you know, you can't get funding for things like this. Right. 
So you mentioned that MDMA was being used in California prior to it becoming a, a social drug. Mm -hmm. how, how did it become a clinical use drug? Well, what happened is uh, it was uh, patented around uh, in 1917 to 1919 in that area uh, by, I think, Merrick, uh, a German pharmaceutical. And the patent had run out. And in the 70s, uh, Dr. Sasha Shulgin uh, who, who died just uh, not long ago. Uh, he was a friend of ours. Sasha uh, was a, uh, well, he was, he worked for himself. And he it was a psychedelic chemist who created literally hundreds of compounds and then published it all. It's all publicly available. But MDMA was one that he investigated. And uh, he, he could see right away what kind of uh, potential it had. And he had a friend who was a therapist who just retired recently. And he brought him, he, he gave him uh, some, they tried it. And it was, it's such a remarkable uh, substance that this guy came out of retirement and he trained, he's, he's uh, Leo Zeff was his name. And there's a book called The Secret Chief uh, about him. And he did, it was a legal substance at the time. And he trained, I think, several thousand therapists. They, they, at one time, they said there were probably 5,000 therapists on the West Coast using MDMA. This now, is these before. Are psychotherapists or? Uh, yes, uh, psychotherapists, Cl yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them were professionally trained and then trained in MDMA use. See, MDMA is, is uh, it's not a psychedelic. It's uh, actually called an empath uh, empathogen. And the uh, most often comment that you hear from people when they take it for the first time, and almost without exception, people say, oh, I've felt like this before. And it, it, you don't see wild images and stuff. Like, for most people, 99% of them, there's a few people have adverse reactions to it. So it's not, you know, it should be done. Nothing's perfect. You know, you have to have some kind of guidance with it. But the... Uh, it, it's uh, what uh, in the 60s they hoped LSD would be because, but this is LSD without the trip. It's just a, a, a childhood feeling of everything on a best spring's day. You know, it's a feeling you have. And the other part of it is it lowers barriers of, I don't know, I'm not trained to say what they are, but uh, you can talk to somebody and, and just speak complete truth, you know, and knowing that that person isn't going to be hurt because they're on the substance too, and you can have the most honest conversations. It, they, uh, they won't go into fight flight. Right, right. It kind uh, of uh, uh, enables them not to have a have a fight flight reaction. Yeah, and 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 that's why it's so good in therapy is uh, because it's it's uh, it doesn't uh, trip you out. It doesn't uh, get you all goofy, uh, but it 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 is. Uh, it's something that with guided therapy is going to change a, a lot of lives for the better. So, what is what what? How does MDMA function in the brain? Oh, gee, <laughs> I'm curious. I, I can only I, that, I can only tell you one thing I know for sure, and that is the Oprah Winfrey thing of the pictures of holes in the brain. She knew going into that that she was lying. They called the station. They called the late the woman whose uh, brain image was used. That was. Uh, an image of blood flow in the brain. There were no holes in her brain. There are probably few people on the planet that have taken more MDMA than me, and uh, uh, I won't go into all that because I didn't know how I, I had no peers. You know, I was all alone, and uh, I abused it. I was horrible. <laughs> and, and your brain, and and your brain still, is in good shape. <laughs> you know, if I hadn't done all that, I might be a real genius right now. <laughs> Who knows? I think you are a real genius <laughs> but, right now. But it's... it's it. Uh, from a psychological standpoint, it just eases the the all of the tension and pain. You know, at the at the time I first took it, I was I was still having some. You know, I was waking up at least once a week with what I called navy dreams. You know, I'd be screaming myself awake, and it was kind of uh, upsetting to my ex wife. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to you. And and you know, I was having that. The company was having financial problems. Our marriage was kind of on the rocks. And. Just doing this myself and then with my ex-wife, uh, we were married another seven or eight years after that and got through all of those big hard times. And uh, that's with self-medicating without any uh, real good assistance. So it's, it's, it's almost a miracle drug uh, in that regard. And yet, it's, uh, most of the people who have used it have no idea what it is because it's kids at raves. Right. And, and so is, is it physically addictive? Oh, no, had, just the you opposite. Say it, uh, you abused it. 
I, but the, reason, the reason I was abusing it is because you build up a tolerance for it. And uh, I, I got to where, uh, well, I wanted to really test it, and I took a, a major dose. And it was like another six or seven years before I could even get a tingle from it again. If you use too much of it, it will stop working totally. And chemical in the brain that, brain that it's utilizing, I believe. You, you know, I just can't tell you about that. I, I you'll have we'll, to get some. We'll have to do another I, show. I'll on tell that. you somebody that, that you could do so is if, if we could get him to come down here is Dr. Charlie Grobe, who is uh, at uh, Harbor UCLA Medical School. And he did, uh, one, he did, I think, the very first human study up at UCLA with uh, MDMA and humans. And uh, he, he also did the study, the first one with psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and, and uh, the dying. And that study, uh, Mary C. was his assistant on for the first half of that. So uh, uh, between she and he, you can get a lot of information on those two substances. So you and Mary C., now you met at a, at a, um, a conference about m- mind-altering it's the it was the Entheobotany conference in uh, Palenque, Mexico, and uh, basically it was a week, and all of the there were very few big names in the psychedelic community at the time. You know, there was Terence McKenna and Ann and Sasha Shulgin, and you know a few others, and that was it. Well, they got together and had a conference every year down in Palenque, in this beautiful spot where everybody had their own little stone cabin. We ate uh, communally and family style. So all of these big name speakers and authors, you had meals with them. You got to know them. And it was really a, a interesting uh, group of people. And, and they did it for uh, probably uh, nine years or something like that. That, that the year I went was uh, actually the last year that Terrence McKenna made it there. He, he died the following year. And nobody knew that at the time, but uh, it was in the Chiapas in Mexico. And it was back when all of the, the danger was going on down there. So my traveling companion and I in Tampa thought, you know, we were both in our, uh, well, I was, he was in early 60s. I was in my late f- middle 50s. And we thought we were being really brave going down to the Chiapas <laughs> to a drug conference. And, and there's Mary C. laying by the pool. And it was her fourth or fifth year there. <laughs> so all the macho stuff disappeared quickly. Oh, that's great. <laughs> That's great. But, uh, and and so what what did you take away from that conference? A wife? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> now, it was, uh, in fact, uh, my, my traveling companion just got through. He's also the editor in, uh, for my, my novel that I'm going to put out uh, in paperback. And, and uh, he came back one, the Sunday afternoon. They went out to the ruins. Uh, everybody went out to the ruins where uh, one of the experts was taking him around. But I stayed home and uh, stayed back at the cabin and ate a bag of mushrooms. And when he came back, I said, I've taken a hard left turn. And uh, six months later, I'd left my job and moved out here. And so that's, you know, I, I'd completely changed my life at that conference. Wow. Just total change of direction. But, you know, I was, uh, I'd been divorced for a number of years. My kids were out of you know, school. You know, I had no girlfriend. I was making a bunch of money, but I didn't like my job. And so, you know, I was ready. You were ready. Well, <laughs> Poor I, Mary C. didn't have a chance. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned on your, on your uh, web page about when you left uh, the legal field, about just wanting to to. to be somebody that was making a difference in the world. But that that was uh, that was really a different thing. I can still remember that day that that uh, I, I was in, in the Navy Reserve to finish up law school, and my commanding officer and I started a law firm together, and uh, hired a couple other lawyers. And so we were mainly doing real estate work. We owned a title company as during the '70s in Texas and Houston, and and uh, our biggest client was a developer who came in one day, and he was sitting across the desk from me, and he was. He wanted to sue a subcontractor. And I said, well, Jim, you're going to lose. He's right and you're wrong. And he says, oh, I know that. I just want to hurt the guy. And I said, excuse me a minute. I walk next door to the next office to my partner. And I says, uh, figure out what my share is worth. I'm out of here. I, I did not go to law school to do to hurt people. So, uh, But I was fed up. By it. <laughs> and, yeah, I loved law school. You know, I really enjoyed law school, but I didn't like practicing at all. I had my own problems. People were bringing me their problems. You know, what was that all about? <laughs> Give me some MDMA. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the podcast has been going on since 2002? And from five, yeah. 2005. Yeah. And, about nine and a half years, something like and, that. And, I mean, the wealth of information that's on there. I mean, we're, we're not, it's not just about psychedelics. You have uh, conferences from, from 
many uh, well-known uh, doctors and researchers and and people that have been at the the forefront of the psychedelic movement. Out of all of it, what what's been kind of your your favorite part of it all? Well, obviously, it's Terence McKenna. You know that. Uh, he, you know, because of Terrence, is, you know, I wouldn't know Mary C., I wouldn't be here. That uh, I, I didn't know anything about him uh, for the longest time. And it was back in uh, the late 90s. I, I used to, maybe 94, 95. Mondo 2000 was a magazine that was, uh, I, was I liked. It was, uh, uh, it's no longer around, but it was a really big, slick, uh, geek, psychedelic magazine. And there's an interview in there with Terrence McKenna. I'd never heard of Terrence McKenna. I'd never heard of DMT, which he was talking about. And that just really stuck with me. Well, several years later, while I was uh, working at home, going through the junk mail, here's Terrence McKenna speaking up at Omega Institute. And so I went up there, and long story, he said, well, you ought to come to Palenque, and I go there to Matt Mary C. And then he died uh, in uh, April of 2000. But he was sort of like... Every, he didn't want to be a guru, but everybody's following him. He, he was a strange guy because his voice is unusual, and and uh, yet he never prepared his talks. He he just you know people would ask questions, he'd talk. He was he's really a brilliant guy, and uh, so I kind of wanted to keep the second the first podcast I did was my own talk that I gave at a Mind States conference, and the second one I gave is the one that was his last one in Palenque. A friend of mine had recorded it for me, and. Uh, so I have, I started at, at, at in about, or before that, actually, just a, a couple of years before I started the podcast, he had a huge archive with, with hundreds or maybe thousands of rare books. He gave it all to Eslin and it got burned. His entire archive, his manuscripts, his work in progress, his rare books, everything gone. And so I've kind of like made it a mission to uh, preserve his, his thought. And as a result, people send me from all over the world talks that they've recorded of Terrence McKenna. And uh, now I've got over 200 of his up there. So he's, he's preserved and his thought is there. Well, and I think, I think his philosophies are now so timely. Uh, more and more people are embracing mm-hmm. this, this concept of, of uh, waking up, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and you know, he, he, uh, he was the one that came out with that line, your culture is not your friend. You know, right. culture is a cult. And, and that doesn't mean culture is bad. It means we need to change the cultures. And, uh, you know, he, he uh, did a lot of tongue-in-cheek things, too. You know, he, he didn't take himself as seriously as a lot of his followers are taking him. And so I'm also trying to, uh, you know, point that out and all. And, Bring the uh, humor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I barely knew him. I met him at a conferences a couple times. You know, I, I didn't get to know him very well. But uh, the people that do did know him, and including his son and all, I'm in touch with those people. And uh, so we're trying to uh, keep his thoughts alive and, and to point out where he was kind of off base and a little wacky about a few things, you know, but uh, <laughs> we most, all are. Most humans are, right. Yeah. So I just want to, I want to invite the listeners, our listeners, this is your show, guys. If you have questions or comments or interests that you'd like to share, please call 206 600 Two four seven five. You can also go to healthandwellnessencinitas.com. All of the show notes, links back to Lorenzo and the other shows that we've hosted will be there. But please call us. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, and, and you can do that by calling 206-600-2475. So, Lorenzo, what do you think is the future for psychedelics and medicine? Well, I think that psychedelics are in the more distant future. It's uh, going to be in the 2020s before even MDMA is uh, approved for therapy, most likely. The big news is medical marijuana. It's what's going on in the cannabis world as far as longevity, uh, anti-cancer, anti-tumor. Uh, the, the, the research in cannabis is awesome. There's like 50 or 60-some cannabinoids that can be... Uh, prepared in various percentages and all. And there, we have a, a, an acquaintance up in Northern California who's, a, I guess you'd call him a gerontologist. He, he, uh, his patients are all in their you know, nursing homes and things like that. He has, over the last number of years, been weaning his patients off of their prescription medicines and getting them solely on cannabis. 
and the results have been nothing short of astounding. Uh, in in some of these homes where uh, more than two or three people are getting off it, they're reporting, oh, the people are talking again, they're off their meds, all these terrible side effects aren't happening, their appetites have improved, you know. <laughs> of course. And so it's, it's uh, really, uh, uh, there's a big revolution going on, and uh, delivery of cannabis is a problem because, you know, people don't like to smoke, and smoking... There's actually a study in Australia that shows that people who actually smoke cannabis have better lungs than people who have never <laughs> smoked anything, cigarettes or anything. Really? Yeah, I can't, you know, I'm 72 years old. I take zero prescription medicines. I, cannabis is the only medicine I use. And, uh, you know, most people my age are, are not so lucky. Uh, but we've seen other pe- known of other people who have come off their meds to get rid of those horrible side effects of the medicines bumping into each other. And cannabis will take care of of so many things. And, you know, I'm not qualified to really talk about it, but somebody, uh, if you can find, there's some doctors here in town that really know what's going on. But we just had uh, some friends show us uh, in Oregon, which is really advanced as far as uh, medical marijuana. They're, they're, uh, you know, these... uh, these electric cigarettes, these e-cigarettes? The vaporizers. The vaporizers, yeah. And, and the cannabis community has been vaporizing for years, but now they've got the e-cigarette variety, and the oil that they put in there is uh, it's tested. You know exactly the percentage of THC and CBD, and it even has a, a lot number. And so it's really starting to take it more to a medical level to where you know what you're getting. And uh, I, I see the, the old age community being the place where it really starts uh, you know, rolling. And when, when cannabis is legal nationwide and some of the research can, can uh, really start rolling in this country that's going on in Switzerland and Israel and places like that. You know, during the, the, uh, the last Gulf War in Israel, they were getting ready to uh, issue cannabis marijuana to every citizen because uh, it would uh, prevent uh, the gas attacks. It was an antidote for the gas attacks. And so they've done research on that. We've done no research here. How, explain. Well, how, you know, how is it an antidote for the... I don't know. I, I, <laughs> there, like, you need a doctor I in do, here. Do. Is there a doctor well, in the house? You're the reporter, but <laughs> I, it's amazing because you have so much information. I mean, you, you've you analogized yourself. You're, you're a reporter that you report all of this information. You, you know, that's really a misnomer. I'm more of a carnival barker. A carnival barker. <laughs> all the action's in the tent. You know, my job is to get people to go into the right tent and take a look around. And but check it out. I, you can go out on the web and find uh, information about uh, the Israel. Uh, Israeli government uh, was going to issue uh, cannabis to back back during the Saddam Hussein days, uh, but the uh, just the wealth of information that's going on. See, in this country, Rick Doblin and Maps has been trying to do a marijuana study for over twenty years, but according to the protocol, he could only do it with marijuana grown by the official government agency, and NIDA would never approve it, so they they would not let it loose. And that's why there's been no medical marijuana research in this country all this time because it's been held up by bureaucrats. But what's happened is the bureaucrats have gotten old and retired, and there's a whole new batch of them coming in. And so things are getting approved much more readily through the FDA and DEA than ever before. And now you use it as a medicine. Do you use it as needed? Do you take it regularly as like a a prophylactic for for symptoms? I I wait till I use it every day. But it's, you know, I wait until sometime during the day. I, I, I sit at the computer too much. I don't get up often enough. My posture isn't great. So once I start noticing that back and hip pain, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take some tokes. And what I've noticed about it is it doesn't make the pain go away. So you still have that, that uh, uh, stopgap there that you won't hurt yourself. You know, you're, there's, it's not like a football player getting a shot. It makes you not notice it. But, you know, if, if you start doing something that you, you're out of your ordinary movement or something, it'll, pain will still be you're there. Still, you're still conscious of your body and still conscious mm-hmm. of, of your limitations mm-hmm. and what's, what's healthy for your body. Because I know with opiates, uh, with prescription medication uh, like uh, Vicodin or Percocet, mm-hmm. uh, it, one of the issues with that is they'll be painless. They won't feel the pain right. and then they re-injure. Exactly. And, and so I totally get it. So it's like you're... You're able to to tolerate you just refocus and feel, mm-hmm. uh, 
feel more comfortable in the body, right. even with the body having pain. Mm-hmm. And and now they're they're really getting uh, cannabis uh, medical marijuana to where you can get the content of the THC, which makes gives you the buzz, lower, and the CBD, which has so many medical properties, higher. Uh, we know of one person who has a big uh, farm in China raising uh, high CBD plants where they extract CBD and it's shipped to uh, Europe for medical purposes. Uh, they can't ship it into this country, but uh, uh, the European community is using uh, CBD pretty widespread. And we talked about the vaporizers and smoking it, mm-hmm. but you, you can ingest it as well. Or is it, can it be just eaten or, because they have like oils? And- yeah, the, the oils you vaporize, uh, or you, you could, you know, ingesting it is, is uh, the easiest way because you don't have to smoke or vaporize or something like that. But the dosage is difficult. And uh, so if you're, if you're, uh, uh, you want to recycle like I do, you take, after you vaporize your cannabis, it's just taking the the THC off the surface, but there's still some inside. Right. We call that vapo poop. <laughs> <laughs> and you take your vapo poop and you process it in a crock pot with butter, and you make can of butter, and it it puts THC and CBD in the in the butter. Then you use that butter to cook, cook with. And so what we've learned by trial and error, because every batch is different, you know, the percentage of the THC in the cannabis is different and the butter extract and all. So once you get all this done, you take a quarter of a teaspoon of just the butter and you eat it and then you just wait and wait and wait and see what happens. And then you, from there, you know what the dosage is going to be for your brownies and all you do the I division see. if you do it the right way. <laughs> but see, the other thing is that when you eat it, uh, people's metabolisms are so different that for some people, they'll start feeling a buzz in an hour to hour and a half. Somebody like me, it's three hours. And so what happens is after like two hour point, they say, oh, it didn't work. I should have some more. And you have some more and then pretty soon you're laid out. <laughs> but the best thing for eating it is to take it just before you go to bed and then it will uh, really give you a good night's sleep. Got it, got it. And so cannabis is being used not only for pain relief. We talked about for tumor, for tumors, and uh, for sleep. Is there anything else? Oh well, you know I'm not the right person to be talking to here. And in fact, just I'm I'm remiss. And Mary C sent me a list of a whole bunch of things yesterday. I thought, uh-huh. you know, I'm I'm really not a doctor. I shouldn't be talking about uh, these things. But you can go, you can go to uh, in on the web. You know, there's so much information. Uh, uh, good place to start is maps, M-A-P-S dot org. Uh, they've got a good starting point, but the very best place to go for information about any of this stuff is Arrowwood, E-R-O-W-I-D, Arrowwood dot org. Uh, this is a couple started this website uh, 15 years or so ago. It was a database they put together for their friends in their neighborhood about drugs. This is now one of the top 100 sites on the web. Uh, the DEA goes there. They have sec- special sections for police, and uh, it's it's where the police and the DEA goes to find out about a new drug on the street because uh, they, their reports are all screened. People can't just post them. They they uh, have a whole staff of people, and it takes you know six eight months to get a report up there. But what I tell people to do if they're they're they want to look at medical marijuana and the research, this has got links to all of the the literature. Not just in the U.S., but everywhere. So uh, it's it's a really good place to start. Well, you're a wealth of information, Lorenzo, and uh, I, I'm i so grateful that you came and you're sharing everything. And I think firsthand information is oftentimes more powerful. Uh, of course, people like to see the research. They like to see the science. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you've you've actually lived it and and lived it from a perspective that you didn't go looking for it, but it found you and has made such a huge difference. You talked about a couple of pivotal moments. Would you, what would you say was the, the most defining moment in your life? In my whole life, and this is something that <laughs> has nothing to do with any of this that we've been talking about, but I can, I can pinpoint a point in my life when everything changed. At, uh, it, I went to a small Catholic boys' school up in the Midwest, and on every other Tuesday night, a science and engineering majors, Tuesday night was Black Tuesday. We did a, had a physics test. And we finished the test. My roommate and I were, were 
starting to walk out the building. It's like February, and we couldn't get the front door open because the wind was blowing so hard. So we had to go out the back door of the engineering building. There's a little eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper with a hand scrawled note that said, "Learn how to sail free." And there's a little sketch of a palm tree, and it really appealed to me that night. A palm tree in a sailing boat. I took the sailing lessons. Uh, that was my freshman year. Wound up becoming captain of the sailing team at Notre Dame. I taught sailing at Houston Yacht Club. I became a lawyer in Texas because of that. Everything flowed from that one decision to go out the back door. So <laughs> watch for coincidences. Sign, yep. <laughs> well, it's all awareness, right? That gets back to that wake yep. up, pay attention. Exactly. And, and that's why I look at coincidences and synchronicities, that if they stop happening, you're on the wrong trail. There are little pieces of corn along your trail. So make sure you have a few of those happen every month. <laughs> and the synchronicities when when things are happening that seem like coincidences. Right, right. I, I just uh, learned about one yesterday. I, I put out a new podcast, uh, in, and it's kind of out of my ordinary uh comfort zone and it was about the Ferguson riots and all stuff going on and, and I mentioned the IWW the uh, Industrial Workers of the World I'm a member and I said something about it and I got this email from this kid yesterday and he said I moved to Houston from Russia two months ago to help build the IWW I listened to your podcast first one I've ever listened to an hour after I paid my first month's dues and that's what I was talking about and that so him to him that was the synchronicity that he uh, needed to know he was on the right track so those are the little things I love hearing about you know I uh, I'm curious uh, what other uh, what other substances are are being talked about as far as because you mentioned um, new drugs coming out or new new substances that are psychedelic being used uh, what's what's the next thing well there's the, the, the ones that are actually going to be heard about and researched uh, seriously are, are the ones we've talked about uh, MDMA cannabis uh, psilocybin uh, the the uh, one thing that you will start hearing about probably have already that you won't see much uh, research in this country for a while, but is ayahuasca, which is a brew that comes out of the uh, Amazon. And it's, a, uh, it's an extremely potent uh, experience, uh, and, and it, uh, DMT is the active ingredient in that. And uh, the closest place for you to find a source of DMT is in your own brain, because your brain actually makes it. Uh, nobody knows why yet or what it's used for, but it is an endogenous uh, chemical. Well, the uh, ayahuasca, to me, if, if uh, I had prostate cancer uh, well, back in the 90s or something like that, if I ever had a resurgence of something serious like that, I would head to the jungle immediately. I've had some experiences with ayahuasca that are amazing. And I know of, of two researchers who are uh, right now also working on funding to take uh, veterans with PTSD down to the jungle for uh, therapy with ayahuasca, with professional therapists and, and the, the brew itself. So ayahuasca is something that you'll probably see it mentioned uh, more and more. Something that they hallucinate or? Well, it, it's uh, DMT uh, can be smoked and give you a, it's the most powerful psychedelic experience, most likely. Uh, but if you eat it, uh, it, it, you have no reaction because uh, of the MAO. So you need an MAO inhibitor in your gut. And it turns out the ayahuasca vine itself is the MAO inhibitor, and the chacruna leaves are, have the DMT. They put it together and cook it. Now, how did they know 1,000, 1,500 years ago they needed an MAO I? to add to the chacruna, you know, that <laughs> it's, it's still, a, a, a you know, a puzzlement. And, Some of that uh, synchronicity was happening back then. Too. Right. In fact, Terrence uh, McKenna's brother, Dennis, went on to get a PhD, and he is the researcher that isolated the, the activity of ayahuasca and figured out how it works. And uh, ayahuasca is something that you don't do alone. You do it, it's the only uh, substance in this whole thing that... Uh, uh, it's highly recommended to make sure you're in a circle with an Iowa scarrow that knows what they're doing. And now it's become such a big uh, tourist thing in, the, in South America. There's a lot of charlatans. You've got to be very, very careful in, in getting your information right before you go down there. There's been some dangerous things that happen. But for the legitimate ones, you uh, sit in a circle. person comes up to the front of the room one time, and one at a time, and a little shot glass of stuff that is is thicker than pea soup 
and is the most vile <laughs> substance you could imagine putting in your mouth. And your next 45 minutes are concentrated on keeping it down because <laughs> it's got to get in your system. After that, things take over. And uh, I've, I've, had, I've had the single most uh, over-the-top experiences. I, I had one that I, I, when I came out of it, I was surprised the whole world hadn't just disappeared and transformed. It was just, like, <laughs> awesome. But, and then I've had others that were not much happened. You know, it's, it's interesting. And, and the big talk, oh, you throw up on ayahuasca. Well, the first uh, six or seven times, I did not. And uh, they call it purging. And uh, the Iowa Scaros say it's, it's, it, as long as you've done the diet right, it's, it, you're not getting sick to your stomach. You're purging up psychic material. So it, and I, the intention I used on one of them, early one, I said I wanted to get rid of my fear. And you sit there with a bucket next to you just in case. And so it, you're going on, the ceremony's going on. All of a sudden, a little voice will come in your head and say, pick up your bucket. <laughs> and and you, I started purging. They said, this is your fear coming out. And... It sounds awful, sounds revolting talking about this, but once you've purged on ayahuasca, you're very disappointed if you don't purge the next time because it's like having a 4th of July fireworks inside your head. It's just spectacular. But <laughs> I don't want to go into that too much. But I started purging, and the, the bucket got this black stuff. Now, I hadn't eaten in seven or eight hours, you know, and had only a few sips of water, but the bucket got quite a bit of stuff, and I said, oh, finally, there's all my fear. Oh, no. Hold on to that bike. There's more. <laughs> I purged a lot that night. And I, I can guarantee that uh, whenever I kind of get fearful about anything, I remember that bucket. And uh, uh, the, a lot of people say that ayahuasca will, will help remove your fear of death. Uh, another one we hadn't talked about that will do that is ketamine, but uh, that's being abused quite a bit now, right, too. But that's another substance that has some, some good medical... Be- well, actually, it's being used in burn wards for children right now. They don't use it for adults because adults say, oh, it was really crazy where then you shot me and all this stuff happened and the kids don't report it. They accept it as normal, I guess. I don't know. And th- that was originally used... Uh, it was a tranquilizer. Well, I think it was in burn wards first. It is a, an animal tranquilizer, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's a great, pleasant experience. <laughs> <laughs> Done right. Uh, I only did that twice. Now, again, that's something that you, uh, I can't imagine getting dependent on. Jonathan Ott is one of the uh, experts on addiction, and he, he claims that uh, only about 30% of the people can even get addicted to heroin. And uh, he's, he's addicted himself intentionally to these substances. Then he goes cold turkey and then writes about it, you know. Wow. But Who is this? Uh, yeah. Jonathan Ott, he's, uh, he's another kind of intellectual in the, the psychedelic community. People, but, courageous people willing to do brave things. Yeah, yeah, or crazy things, you know. That. <laughs> but fortunately now, you know, we're getting more acceptance at the FDA, the DEA, and the, the research is getting more formalized. Uh, you know, there's I, – I, I don't – want to say there's anything wrong with dancing all night to, to electronic music on MDMA. You know, I've done it myself, but that's a, a kind of a waste of the substance because if you get in groups of two, three, and four and just talk all night, you'll go a lot farther than you will dancing all night, although you still have to dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think dancing needs to happen. So I always ask uh, our guests, um, of all the things, of all the, the knowledge you have, what would you impart upon listeners, upon other people, as being the number one wellness tip or thing that you would share that you would say, you know, this is this is probably the most important thing you could do. Well, for me, it's my attitude. Uh, you know, I think that, that having the right attitude, and, and it's not going to be easy in the days ahead. I think we've got a year coming at us like 1964 was. You know, it's going to be a big year. And so by having a... a kind of a relaxed attitude. You know, the past is is phony. It doesn't exist. The future has never existed. It's only now, yeah. just here and now. And so don't keep digging. You know, I could dig up a lot of stuff from my past and depress me if I wanted to. But, you know, instead of uh, thinking of Christmas past, I've got uh, these little granddaughters here that are Christmas present, you know. So I think by keeping your mind, uh, you know, what's good going on in your world? You know, the, for most of us, there is some good somewhere, and if you can focus on that, and uh, it, it just makes you want to live. And if you want to live, I think your your body kind of kicks in there and takes over too. And you have and you have your show to keep going. I'm... <laughs> you know that that has been a big thing for me because uh, you know I I uh, I don't know why I I have this uh, I don't like to get up in front of people and talk, but 
the podcast is kind of nice because I feel like I'm doing it, but afterwards they can't find me out that I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to a conference and give a speech, afterwards they come up and ask you a question, and you say, oh, I don't know, I just researched this narrow little thing for the talk, you know, I'm no expert. <laughs> so uh, the podcast is perfect for that. I, I don't have to take questions. <laughs> well, I think it's amazing. I think that you're even effective and more amazing because you're bringing information from a lot of different people on a lot of... Uh, Subst- about substances and subjects that are transformational. And, and see, I'm just listening to these things for myself, and most everything I listen to, I, I say, oh, that's pretty good. I'll put that out on the podcast. But, right. you know, I, I, don't, I don't really have an agenda or anything that as people send me tapes and then talks and I listen to them, and some I like, some I don't, and, and some I'm in the wrong mood for, and a year later I'll say, oh, I think I'll play that one, you know. And so it's, uh, it's a hobby. And it's a good way to spend so my time. You mentioned that you're you now are uh, splitting half the podcasts for the the females in the psychedelic community. I've, I've offered to give them uh, every other program without any input from me. No, uh, you know I'll make commentary before and after. But I, you know, they, they, in fact, there's there's one program that they're going to record with a person that I'm I've been avoiding for years. <laughs> but I, I've given that. I said, you know, I'm not going to censor or approve or disapprove i don't you know you send me the tape when it's ready and and i'll i'll listen to it and i'll make my commentary before and after but i i don't want to censor it and uh, it's worked out really well and and uh, these three women are at such different points in their lives uh and they're all so intelligent you know that it's it's uh, really given they've had some good discussions among themselves that have been an eye-opener for me i I didn't realize, uh, you know, the issues that a lot of women in our community were having. You know, it's been a, you know, good old boys thing. And so I, I said, well, okay, this is one old white man that is not going to get up in the front of the room again. <laughs> we need to let the women up there. And and they've had a legitimate reason for not getting up in the front of the room, even though uh, a significant amount of the work being done in the community is, is underground by women. But they have the, the family issues, you know, and uh, the government will take kids away from people that are doing something illegal. So they have to be very, very cautious and under the radar. Yes. And that's what's happening now. We have a generation of women whose children are out of college, and they can speak up and uh, say their minds for a change. And it's happening. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, on the psychedelic <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lorenzo, thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing all of this information. It's a new world, and I'm so glad that everybody gets to, to hear that transformation is something that can happen uh, without long-term medication. Yes. Physical transformation, psychological transformation, whether we're talking about physical wellness, mental mm-hmm. wellness. There's, there are ancient medicines and practices out there oh. that, that work. And, and, you know, I'm kind of irritated with some of the people that in the pharmaceutical industry are going to try to separate certain ingredients out of the cannabis plant, you know. It bec- it's like the cannabis plant's a whole jungle in there, and there's, there's 50 or 60 things they can take out. But why not use the whole plant? And there is, I don't think you can get addicted physically to cannabis, because I use it every day. And yet, uh, a year ago, I went to a wedding out in D.C., and I, I took the train. And I was gone for uh, two and a half weeks with no cannabis and cold turkey. I never even noticed it. I never even thought about it other than I had to take aspirin every once in a while for some back pain. But uh, it's not addictive. It's it's the miracle drug. It really is. And that's the one to be paying attention to more than anything right now. Well, I, I definitely believe anything that's coming straight out of the earth that yeah. is natural, that the body naturally knows how to process it. It evolved with us. You right. know, we co-evolved. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to share before no, we wrap up? That's uh, that's about it. I, I, <laughs> I enjoyed it, but thank you for inviting me, Lisa. Oh, it's been I, a pleasure. It's an honor. It's a true honor. Thank you so much. This is Lisa Thorpe with Health and Wellness Encinitas, and we had Lorenzo Haggerty with Psychedelic Salon today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll listen again soon. This show was produced by John Beethan and brought to you by Alkaway.com, the makers of UltraStream, working like nature to filter, alkalize, and naturally energize water, returning it to its natural, pristine state.